to say uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Billy Drew. I'm with the 12th Ward IPO. Hello, everyone. My name is Miriam Gus Perez, and I'm also with the 12th Ward IPO from Brandon Park. Uh, so, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, just wanted to say that this is an event uh, put on by the 12th Ward IPO, uh, and we are hosting uh, Chicago is Not Broke, the authors of this uh, great book. Um, just to tell you a little bit about our, about our organization. Uh, we are an independent political organization uh, working out of uh, Bright Park, McKinley Park, and Little Village. And we're working to ensure accountability from our elected officials. Uh, you know, our group is about social justice issues and causes. And some of the causes that we have uh, uh, adopted is the uh, term limits on the mayor of Chicago. We're collecting petitions for that. Um, and we're also pushing for the uh, mental health safety net ordinance. Um, so we're working with the mental health uh, uh, movement uh, to get this ordinance pushed because it's something that we really need, um, uh, especially when we have a city and a mayor that claims uh, our city is broke. Um, so I'll let the uh, authors get more into uh, some of the nitty gritty about um, this book. But basically the premise is um, you know, we're, we're constantly being told that we're broke when uh, we want stuff, but when the mayor wants stuff, when Ron wants stuff, the city's not broke, right? There's new taxes, we're being nickel and dimed, and, you know, our working families and our communities cannot afford that. Uh, and so, I'd like to just, uh, you know, get, hand it over to Tom, and um, I'd like to thank the authors who also came out, Mara Enya um, and Jackson Potter. Um, and they're going to talk about their portions of the book. So, again, thank you all for coming. And uh, Tom, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, a shout out to the 12th Ward IPO. You know, in my experience, uh, leadership starts by showing up. And you have showed up. So give yourself a round of applause. For keeping you holding out some gifts from the start or something like that. <laughs> or with your loved ones. But instead, you're here talking with us about why Chicago is not broke. So you guys rock, really, truly. Uh, so who am I? My name is Tom Presser. I call myself a public defender. Like, but not with the courts. You feel me? Okay? We're talking about the, the very nature of the word public in America. What does the word public mean? So, when I say public, what do you think? Public what? Cool. Public schools is the first thing I heard. Public what else? Transportation. Public colleges. Public what else? Transportation. Public transportation. Public what? Arts. Arts. Public what else? Libraries. Uh, libraries. Yes, yes, sir. So these things, these things that have the word public in it, is kind of what makes us great, right? It's kind of what makes um, a great city. Uh, and the more public we have, the better off we are. Do you agree? But unfortunately, in this city, uh, the public is under attack, like we've never seen before. Uh, and it's happening not just here, but all over the world. So the public is under attack. And so that's why I call myself a public defender. So uh, why do we want to talk about money? What's the connection between money and social justice? Anybody? Anybody? Well, you know the answer. What's the connection? What's the connection? Um, the more money the public has, the more private industry wants to take it from. Yeah, but what happens when we have more money? You, you alluded to it, though. What happens when we have more money? Yeah, to do what we want. Uh, we have better communities, we have healthier communities, we have more educated communities. Yeah, yeah. What else you want to say? We grow. We grow. We, we are better than we are now, we just keep growing and growing. It's like, there's more communities growing, there's not more pressing the economy. Yeah, these are the these are the, these are some of the connections. We could probably talk more about it, but you understand it. You guys get it. You know, there was a movie about uh, Watergate, you know, some years ago. I don't know if you remember all the president's men and these investigators trying to figure out the corruption that was going on in uh, the Watergate scandal. And they met some shadowy figure in Dietro, and he said to the he said to the uh, reporter, he said, "Follow the money." Remember that? Follow the money. Remember the movie? Show me the money, right? Show me the money. So politicians will tell you all kinds of smack, but you really want to know how the, how the city's going? Follow the money. Who's got the money? So 
what I want to say before we get into our, our content here is when we think about budgets, it's more than just numbers on the paper, okay? Think about your own homes when you, when you create a budget for the year. You're really planning the future of your household, aren't you? Your, 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 your aspirations going into the, the next year are the things you want to do that year and the year after and the year after that. So you have obligations. You may have mortgage to pay. You may have kids in school. You may have doctor bills. These are things that are you must pay. But part of a budget is your aspirations about where you want to go. Do you take a vacation? Are you saving for a business? These things. You know, you, you want to get a car or, or whatever. It's the same way for the city. The budget for the city is a moral document. Budget for the city is a moral document that says where our values are. Are we going to grow? Who's going to grow? Are we going to be better off this year than next year? Is it a fair place to live? So when we put a budget together, these are some of the things that we're grappling with. So it's not just numbers on a paper. It's, it's how we as a city want to be, where we're going, right? So we need to be in on that conversation. You agree? Yes. Right. This is not just for the accountants, you know, sit somewhere up on the, in the office towers. This is for us to decide. Also, a budget in a place like Chicago is a scorecard. Who's in and who's out? Follow me? We are, we are not in. We are so not in. The values that you all represent here, the things that are important to you, are not being reflected in the budgets that are coming out of City Hall. And Billy alluded to that. When the mayor wants something, there's plenty of cash. But when we want something, I'm so sorry. So that's the reason why we put the book together. The premise is simple. There's a lot of money on the table that's being wasted and not being gathered. The book is divided into the three sections. And um, the first is money that's stolen from us. This is money that we should not have spent nor continue to spend. It's divided into three sections. The first is the cost of corruption in Chicago. Now you know Chicago has often been referred to as the most corrupt city in America. We asked the authors, Dick Simpson and Tom Gravel, to put a number on it. Uh, and the number is staggering, $500 million a year. That's the first number we report to you. So let's not do that anymore, <laughs> okay? Let's stop doing that and save $500 million. Uh, the second is by our colleague Jackson Potter, the cost of toxic bank deals, and I'll let him tell you how that breaks down. So I want to apologize ahead of time. I'm going to be leaving a little early tonight running a, a, a little vote downtown uh, tonight, so hopefully um, you understand. Uh, so, you know, you hear Claypool and Rom give this line lately that we're protecting the classrooms from trucks, right? Everybody's heard that. Uh, and that they've scoured every location to try and get every penny into the classrooms, and they went to Springfield and got money. None of that is really true. Uh, a lot of the money that came were bills that we put together. But when you look at the schools over the last three years, we've recently finished an analysis that shows a 20% decline in the number of counselors, a 20% decline in the number of social workers, a 20% decline in the number of librarians and school nurses, uh, exploding class sizes. I've been to schools all these last few weeks, and you're hearing 39. 45 kids in primary grades. And, you know, principals are being given these impossible decisions to make around, you know, do I cut special ed or do I cut general ed? You know, this Fed budget has been collateralized just like they did with the debt that I'm about to talk about and made the principal decide, you know, which children are going to be served and which children are going to be shortchanged. And this is not something that just happened overnight. It's been a long time coming. And so I remember going to board meetings after we were elected to office. I was with Karen Lewis's team in 2010. And almost immediately, we started attending Board of Education meetings. And uh, the president in 2011 and beyond uh, until 2015 was David Vitale, who was a banker. And Vitale had an earlier term, also in 03, under Duncan, when he was the CEO. And we uh, demanded that Vitaly start looking at these things called toxic swaps. Well, what are toxic swaps? I'll make it real basic, and then I'll wrap up so you guys can ask some questions and we can get into, into deeper discussion. 
If you take out, everybody knows what a home mortgage is, right? So if you take out a mortgage, you get a couple of different choices. You can do a variable rate mortgage. You can do a fixed rate mortgage. If you have a variable rate mortgage, the interest rates are going to go up and down depending on market conditions. If you have a fixed rate for the length and duration of your mortgage, it'll stay the same. It's 3% or whatever it is. The district was in the habit, bad habit in our view, of taking out variable rate bonds. And so they didn't really know from one year to the next how much they were going to owe the banks. And they used this money for everything under the sun. You know, facilities, uh, expanding schools, fixing schools, this lead up epidemic you're hearing about, those sorts of fixes. And they decided, because Vitaly was a banker, that they knew how to manipulate the market better than the, the titans of finance, which is red flag number one, right? And so what Vitaly thought is he'd get this instrument called a toxic swap, what we call it a toxic swap, they call it an interest rate swap, and exchange, do a bet with the bank. They, the bank would pick a synthetic int uh, fixed interest rate, and if interest rates went above that synthetic rate, the district won money. If the interest rates went below that synthetic rate, the banks won money. Well, what happened in 2008? The banks crashed the economy, interest rates go to zero, and we're paying through the nose. And they had no way to renegotiate these, these loans anymore. Had they stayed in the market, they could have renegotiated the loan for a new interest rate, just like you do for your home when interest rates go down. But they were stuck in these bad deals, and the banks knew it, and they knew this was going to happen. So, Tribune does an expose after we've been talking about this scandal for years. Finally, the Tribune breaks the story. And what they discover is that Bank of America was holding secret meetings in 2008, before the economy crashed entirely. And they were talking about how there was going to be a meltdown in the bond market. They failed to inform CPS. And there's a duty of fair dealing built into municipal finance regulations at the federal level. Uh, when they violated those terms by not revealing their knowledge of market conditions, they were liable. And, and what CPS should have done, what Vitaly should have done, what Rahm should have done, is sued their assets. And instead of doing that, because they were in collusion, because those same financial entities were giving Rahm money during his campaign, when he was running for office, both times, he was meeting, you can look at Garafsky's at FOIAs that demonstrate he was meeting with Tim Mahoney, the president of Bank of America, on numerous occasions in his old office in City Hall. So they didn't want to hold the banks accountable. They made up stories. At the same time, they're saying to us, as teachers and paraprofessionals in the schools, that the constitutional provisions protecting our pension in the state constitution are invalid. And they're going to pass legislation despite the fact that there's laws on the book. So the banks break the law, they get off the book. We follow it and we're punished, right? And what this has amounted to is a billion dollars just when you're looking at the school system in the city and all the swaps they had entered into that they've lost. Imagine a billion dollars into the Chicago Public Schools right now. You know, you have librarians, counselors, social workers, school nurses for every single school in the city. You wouldn't be talking about, you know, how do we have a scavenger hunt to decide, you know, who gets to stay on the island, plain survivor, you know? So, that, that's really, you know, all I have to say. And, and if we are to go on strike, uh, there's flyers in the back there about a TIF ordinance that our sister Sue Garza is sponsoring. You know, it's a credit to the good work Tom has done, Ben Jurafsky's done, that this issue has, you know, we've shined a light on it in a big way. And this ordinance would require the mayor every year if the school district's in distress to release that money automatically. He wouldn't have to bestow us with his benevolence and decide I want to release a surplus just you know, because I'm such a good guy. It would happen automatically. And this ordinance is coming up. Uh, Sue Garza, the first teacher in the city council ever elected, is pushing it along with part of us in, in our ward. And that's a testament to this IPO in this room tonight. And I hope you join. I'm a member if you haven't already. And if we go out on strike, that, you know, there's money that could avoid it. Everybody in here should know that. There's flyers that talk about this issue. You know, call your all in if it's not George Cardinal since he's a sponsor, but call him too because we never know, right? And make sure they do the right thing. Um, you know, this 
the Testament to Pete May ran against him on these issues. So, uh, that, you know, that's all I really have to say. Grab some literature, let's spread the word. Uh, you know, Chicago ain't grow. Tom's right. So you get to start talking about big numbers, right? Okay. Um, the next piece in the first section, Money That Stole From Us, is written by a brother, Jamie Calvin, uh, who has been with the Invisible Institute for many, many years, uh, an awesome reporter, investigator, historian. Uh, he writes about the cost of police abuse. This is a very sad, sad thing in our city. Uh, it's hard to put a number on the violence that's been perpetrated in our communities, but unfortunately there is a number, and it's this number. $662 million dollars in uh, 12 years in settlements of legal fees, including for the, the, the Burge, the torture cases. So let's not do that anymore, okay? Uh, we clearly need some new approaches to policing in the city of Chicago. Uh, the cost of stopping these bad practices would save us at least $50 million a year. So that gets added to the total. Okay. Second section of the book, money that's hidden from us. So, we know that they're collecting it, we just can't find it. This is where I come in with the TIFs, the famous tax increment financing. I've run all over the city over the last three years. We've done 45 public meetings, including one for the 12th, 11th awards, uh, illuminating what's going on with these TIFs, these tax increment financing deals. Let me just simply say, it's a slush fund. That's it. And if I had to put it simply, it's a big pot of money controlled by the mayor and his allies. How much are we talking about? Well, if uh, we count up all the money that's been spent on private interests since TIFs came to town, that's $5 billion. So it would be great if we could get that $5 billion back from the undeserving rich and the developers to whom it was given. Uh, if we were to flush the TIF funds, that is to say take the $1.4 billion that we know is in the TIF bank right now, flush that money out and send it to the units of government that should have gotten that money in the first place. We were talking about a one-time cash infusion for the city of Chicago, $843 million. $843 million, of which about half would go to the, the Board of Ed. About half. So imagine a, a cash infusion to the Board of Education of something on the order of $600 million. Would that be tasty? Yeah? Wouldn't we, wouldn't we be talking about strikes? We'll be talking about no librarians for what, 60 schools or something like that. Um, also, if we were to completely blow up TIFs, just get rid of them so they wouldn't be darkening our doorsteps, going forward, the city would have another $421 million in new revenues every year going forward. So if we were to do the following, freeze the TIFs, flush the TIFs, end the TIFs, we'd get a one-time bump of $843 million, and then there'd be another tasty $421 million going forward. So for the first year of this proposed program, the city would enjoy $1.2 billion, just right there. You could, you could go home right now and just like, we solved the problem just with these few things, but we ain't done yet. All right, the third section of the book is called Money That We Are Not Collecting But We Should Be. Now this is where we get to exercise our civic imaginations, uh, and these are the proposals that we put before you. First, a progressive income tax for Illinois. This was written by Hillary Denk of the League of Reserves. Uh, they've been on this case for at least 25 years. The idea is uh, Illinois is a very regressive state. It means it's unfair. The rich are not paying their fair share. The poor folk are paying more than they should. Illinois is, is, is unfortunately notorious for being one of the worst in America for being very regressive. Let's not do that. She proposes, or what the League does, uh, some legislation that would fix that. Uh, conservative estimate. Chicago would enjoy $85 million in new revenue from this, from this fix. It's probably much, much more than that, but this is, this is the number she settled on. Okay, number two, a financial transaction tax for the city of Chicago. How about that, you guys? Sounds good? <laughs> hey, look, you, you go to the store and you buy a can of pop. You pay a tax, right? You, you go to the movie theater, you buy a movie, you buy some popcorn, there's a tax. You buy a car, there's a tax. Who doesn't pay a tax? These millionaire, billionaire gamblers down on the South Street who trade in quadrillion dollars. Quadrillion, that's like, I don't know, that's like 19 zeros. No tax. All we're saying is put a dollar on each end of the trade. The dollar for the seller, the dollar for the buyer. 
and only on the products that we hold a monopoly position on. So these guys have thought this through very thoroughly. Um, and the result would be something on the order of $12 billion each year. And we estimate that Chicago could potentially capture $2.6 billion of that. That's the biggest number in the book. Let's talk about it, huh? Why not? There are many jurisdictions around the world, Singapore, England, uh, many other jurisdictions that do this, and they seem to be doing fine. The market's having a collapse. Then we come to what I think is one of my favorite ideas in the book. It's a public bank. And our uh, authors here are Mark Enya, who you know, ran for mayor last year. She's an expert in public policy and community development. Mara, could you please tell us about public bank? Thank you, Tom. I wanted to actually take the first few minutes of my time to see to Jackson so that he can answer some questions since he does have to leave early if there are questions from the audience uh, for him. Um, do you know the status of the 11th Ward Alderman, if he supports it or not? The TIF ordinance, he does not support it. So Patrick Daly Thompson has not supported this ordinance. Okay. He needs a friend, some friendly visitors. Sweet. <laughs> so the, the how do you agree that the, the, the difference between the kind of counselors versus social workers, uh, librarians, of uh, what? Uh, our own research department did the analysis, but you know, so it's basically looking at position files. So we have access to all of the employee files, and you can also get it online. CPS publishes its position files, so you can do a historical perspective. You know, so is that Civic Labs research? No, this, this is from CPS's own data. So as a public entity, you know, you could FOIA it, you could wait till we publish it, okay. uh, which is going to happen soon. Well, thanks. Raise your hands also done some good like infographics on the cuts that you might want to look up online. Thanks. Yeah. But that's also arguably schools still being understaffed when you're starting. Like twenty percent cut from schools having you know, part time social workers anyway, right. or having one social worker for a fifteen hundred <coughs> student school, things like that. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, we're not even, we're not even like looking we're not doing the number of like where we're at based on what we should be, we're doing it where we used to be which kind of sucked. Basically. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's even worse. If you're thinking about the schools Chicago students deserve, the kind of investment you would need to even get close along the lines of the magnitude that Tom described or what the city needs, right? If you're going to have the types of investments in children's lives and make it equitable. Like, you know, I, I'm a Whitney Young grad. And I love the Dolphins. You know, the Dolphins and everything is like these magnet schools that have the most privileged students, the whitest students, highest incomes, they get extra money from being magnet schools, like per pupil. So you've exacerbated the inequality between the low income black and Latino schools, which predominate in Chicago public schools, by privileging even further the students who need it the least. So yeah, to your point, we should be thinking, you look at Will Met or Winneka, where Ram and Ron are parking from, right? These perfect uh, suburbs of you know, 20k per child in school expenditures. You now they're double what CPS spends per child. Uh, it should be the other way around. You know, the, the most privileged students who need the least should get half of what the most vulnerable students who have been shortchanged the most receive. And we're completely backwards. Um, so you said um, they should see their ass. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, was a, that was the quote. Uh, so <laughs>
paid a, a hundred pennies on the dollar for every single swap that the city entered into and didn't even bother to demand that they you know, reduce that based on their own malfeasance. Rahner is in the process of doing the same thing at the state level and that amounts to about a billion dollars as well. So uh, a number of organizations, the grassroots collaborative in particular, have been pressing Rahner not to pay off roads and you know hold the banks accountable. So he on the state for the state swaps, Rahner could be the one prosecuting the banks. You know, a fat chance, right? He is a banker. What about Lisa Madigan? Yeah, Lisa Madigan. So Lisa Madigan has the authority to do it. Um, you know, you could have a taxpayer lawsuit, it's just not as viable from the experts we've talked to. Uh, and what you would file under that has the best chance of success is this Municipal Rulemaking Securities Board that's a federal agency. Uh, Alabama, uh, Baldwin County, Alabama sued banks for the same scandal, virtually identical, and won back every single penny that they had paid out to the banks. What was the name of that body? Uh, MRSB, so it's the Municipal Rulemaking Securities Board. So that's, you know, one vehicle. There, there's others, um, you know, there's other federal agencies you could appeal to, and we have. Uh, but that's sort of the most clear angle that, that they could have taken immediately that they have lost out on. The window is shut. You know, the statute of limitations is over. They knew that. We told them with plenty of time where they could have taken action. They refused.
it's absolutely important to contextualize this conversation and why we're here. We're here because this book is an organizing tool. We did not pour through, I know Tom certainly did not pour through years of TIFF data to keep the information to himself and for his own edification. I mean, maybe he did, but <laughs> I highly doubt that. I myself, I do this for fun, which is quite nerdy, but those of us who actually like pouring through the numbers, I do read through the entire city budget, have done so for the last four years, do translate that to community groups uh, and organizations around the city and especially where I live on the west side of Chicago and Garfield Park. Uh, because for so long we have been mystified by this area of municipal finance. And in fact, what's happened in the last election was that everyone was told that there's only one man in the city who can solve the city's finances. There's only one man who understands the numbers. There's only one man with a magic bullet to make sure that the city is solvent. And then what did we learn? We learned that the solution was simply to borrow, was to go further in debt. There were no innovative ideas, there were no, not even common sense ideas to address the city's fiscal circumstances. We are at over $8 billion. If you look at over the last five years, the amount that the city has borrowed, it's in the billions, and that was the big solution. That's not what we need. What we need is a fundamental restructuring of the city's economy to create a growth economy. What does a growth economy look like? One where we can actually stay in the city, first and foremost. It's one where we can sustain ourselves as individuals and our families. It's one where we don't get pushed out of our neighborhoods because your property taxes are sky high because now you have to pay an additional $250 a year for water because now the cloud is being taxed because next thing you know the air that you breathe is being taxed. We have a scarcity economy and we're all feeling it. The only way to combat that is to, with the same boldness with which they have played with our money, to put forth the ideas that we know can transform our neighborhoods and transform the city's economy. What is for certain is that the city always bets on the taxpayer. We are experiencing a massive transfer of wealth from people like us to the very wealthy and the very elite. So the same individuals that negotiated these horrendous deals with the banks, with the major financial institutions, they're the same ones that the city then calls to renegotiate the deals, where now we have triggers that cause us to pay $200 million at a time, $400 million at a time. And when I say the city always bets on the taxpayer, it's because they always bet on a property tax increase to cover up misdeeds. Now here's the connection. Public bodies are not roughly generated mechanisms. And this is why this, the chapter that focuses on corruption is so important. Because corruption wastes money, limited funds that public bodies have. And once that money is gone, there is no way to magically get it all back. Even if we sue, even if we, all of those steps that we can take. And this is why stewardship of public funds is absolutely essential. So when we have corruption, whether it is cronyism, whether it is the politically connected that get access to sweetheart deals, whether it is a uh, red light camera operator who has taken bribes so that he can make sure that his company gets the sweet contract from the city, we, the taxpayer, pay for it. The parallel would be in the police misconduct cases where we've not paid, I think, a half billion dollars, 500 million, 10 years, and where you have a mayor that will talk about transparency, while having his attorneys actively fighting FOIA requests, actively fighting against requests for information, actively attempting to cover up misdeeds and corruption within the departments. And it's hard for us to get that money back. But they always bet on the taxpayer because they know that, well, we'll just raise property taxes. I mean, they're going to pay for it, right? They'll always come back to us. So we end up paying for that corruption. What we have
have to do, and this is why I, I, part of what I see my responsibility is to demystify the finance process, to demystify municipal finance. It can seem complicated because it's numbers, but it's not that complicated. What's actually necessary is a healthy dose of common sense and integrity and a commitment to equity. All things that we've been lacking in this city for decades, quite frankly. And so what we've done with this book is we've attempted to make it a little bit easier to think about different solutions that are quite possible. None of this is outlandish. Everything that's being proposed has been done before somewhere. Now what you'll find is you'll come against a narrative of, well, we can't really do that because X or because Y or because... You'll, you'll always get that. But we have to push back with the same fervor because we know that it's possible and because we don't really have an alternative for those of us who plan and hope to be able to stay in the city. So my chapter focuses on a public bank. This is something that I'm very passionate about because as, as one of the individuals who asked the question alluded to, we have these major financial institutions that collude with governments, with our leadership, who have negotiated horrendous deals for which we, the taxpayers, now end up paying. Who, those individuals who are politically connected, will do everything possible to prevent the tide from turning. So I had the pleasure of being in, in a testimony, it was for state legislators on the public bank, also on the financial transaction tax, where the, the presidents of the Chicago Board of Exchanges, the Mercantile Exchange, were there I mean, they were so adamant, not because they didn't have the capacity, not because they don't recognize the validity, but because they just don't want to be on the chopping block. <laughs> but it's okay for we, the taxpayers, to be offered up every time. So what a public bank does is it actually takes allegiance from shareholders in traditional large financial institutions, and it places allegiance with the taxpayers. A public bank is capitalized by existing assets that we currently now hold in those traditional financial institutions, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, all of those that ilk, I'll say. We currently hold our assets there. So you don't need a massive infusion of new revenue, you simply need to shift revenue and funds, taxpayer funds that are currently held in those institutions to capitalize a public bank. The beauty of it is that the whole goal of a public bank is to spur economic development. It is to actually grow the economy. So this isn't a traditional depository bank where you go in, you make your deposit, you make your withdrawal. The areas of focus specific to it are areas that we really have to consider how much money we're wasting, how much money we're spending unnecessarily. One, infrastructure projects. The billions of dollars that we spend repairing our roads, repairing our water systems, other major infrastructure projects that the city has to undertake. Right now, we pay typically 40 to 50 percent on interest just on those projects alone to traditional financial institutions. So imagine if you have a project that's a billion dollars, how much you're paying interest on that to the financial institution. It's not money that we see, it's not money that comes back to us. It is simply on top of the cost of the project. With a public bank, the interest rates are substantially low, and any revenue generated actually goes back into the city's treasury. So that money recirculates into our economy. It doesn't go to uh, $20 million CEO salaries or any of those golden parachutes. It doesn't go to any of that. It actually comes back into the city's treasury. Year in and year out, the amount of money that will come back to the city by virtue of that single factor alone can help to, to, can help to turn the tide of our city's economy. Another area that's very important to me because I work with small businesses on a daily basis, I manage a chamber of commerce on the west side. One of the biggest challenges that small businesses and entrepreneurs face is access to capital, whether it's for startup capital or capital to expand their operations. And this is absolutely critical because ownership is one of the best keys to building wealth, especially in challenged communities. When we live in a city where creating jobs for the working class has not been a top priority, the alternative to that is ownership. I personally opt for cooperative ownership and cooperative businesses 
because it, it shares ownership amongst the workers. But even traditional ownership is absolutely crucial. And the biggest obstacle is getting access to capital. You get turned down for a loan, or the interest rate is too high on the loan. Well, if we're not opening up small businesses, they're not hiring, right? Small businesses typically hire from the community. They serve the community. A lot of times the owners are from the community. So it is a matter of our city's interest to encourage as many individuals who want to open businesses to be able to do so. But if they continue to run up against redlining, which still happens, if they continue to run up against the rejections from banks, from traditional banks, because they're too risky, then we won't grow the number of small businesses in the city. And so the alternative to that is having a public bank that would actually be able to support lending to more entrepreneurs so that we can open up more businesses in the community so that more people can become owners. They can hire more. So that's another strategy that having a public bank would allow us to do. Now what happens when you invest in small businesses they pay taxes. So we have to really draw the connection between the lack of having businesses and communities means that the city is not getting tax revenue. Right? And so that leads me to my third point, and the third connection that I wanted to make is access to home loans that a public bank is able to issue. Low interest home loans. When our population constricts, the city loses revenue. So everything that I'm saying, it's not just out of the spirit of benevolence and because sounds great. There's also a financial incentive. When people are living in homes, they are paying property taxes. If people can't afford to pay their property taxes, they can't afford to purchase homes, that's lost revenue for the city. So that goes into the bucket of revenue that we should be collecting or could be collecting that we're not. So a public bank would allow for those low interest home loans, getting more people buying homes. I know for millennials, many of us I think I'm, I don't know, I might have passed the millennial threshold. But I just put myself in that category. <laughs> but many of us have not, we're not buying homes. Who wants to be settled on top of the student loan debt? If you're like me and did everything you were supposed to do and went and collected degrees and went to college and then came out into the economy and you're saddled with significant amounts of student loan debt. You're paying your student loans and a mortgage on top of that. They're not doing it. And that student loan is actually, that's the next bubble after the housing crisis. And in fact, it might be bigger. So home ownership, and then for young people, for people looking to buy homes, we also have the student loan issue, which a public bank also serves a function. So we talk about the importance of education and going to college. Personally, I believe that um, we shouldn't have a notion of 100% college bound. I think there needs to be a kind of require that there is vocational education, that there are certification programs in specific sectors, whether it's IT, events, manufacturing, even basic trades, electricians, carpenters, <coughs> plumbers, trades that have been systematically removed from CPS, by the way. But whatever our young people are going to do, they should have the opportunity to do so. And that means being able to get access to student loans at low interest rates that they can pay back because they have a job in the city of Chicago. So that's four areas through which a public bank for the city would actually help us to grow the economy in ways that are not shuffling the deck on the chair, the chairs on the deck of the Titanic is how I see what we've been doing. A lot of the conversations around revenue in the city are, how do we save $50,000 by this new fee that we're going to implement? How many red light cameras and speed cameras can we put up in the community to get those extra dollars? How many taxes can we raise before everyone moves out, moves to Texas, or Atlanta, or California, or wherever, at least the winters aren't as bad and it's cheaper. That's what's happening. And so it's the lack of imagination that causes us to have a lack of ideas about how to fundamentally address the fiscal issues that we see in our city. But we in this room now have at least a starting point. This isn't the end of the conversation. This is just the beginning. This is to get 
to get us thinking, to get us imagining what would an equitable city look like? What would it look like if I could just walk to my neighborhood school? What would it look like when parents don't have to, as soon as their children are born, start scrambling to identify which magnet school or selective enrollment school they want to place their kids into? What would it look like for young people to feel that we can actually stay in the city that we love and find work? What would it look like to be able to live on the west side of Chicago, but be just as valued as our counterparts on the north side, or on the south side, or on the southeast side? We have to be the ones who imagine. Because they're not. They're betting. They're actually betting on us not having an imagination. They're betting on us accepting the notion that the status quo is all that there is. They're betting on us being mystified by the numbers so that they can come in and tell us what, what's good for us, but it's really what's good for them. And so my charge is really to see this book as a conversation starter. We're engaged in these conversations around the city. The goal is to facilitate some of the thought process behind what are some solutions to the, to the issues that we face, especially from a financial standpoint. And how do we arm people with the language to be able to advocate in our best interests so that when they hit us with all of the things that they will hit us with, especially once election season rolls back around, and the promises start rolling, and the slogans start coming out. We want the public to have a different vision. In fact, we want the public to have a vision, an alternative of what we have right now. And so I'm hoping that you get copies, that you contribute ideas, there'll be opportunities for you to contribute different ideas on how things that might not be in the book. But again, this is, this is an imagining process. And I'm hoping that that will help excite more people to get involved so that we can really, whole scale, turn the tide.